Okay. All right, I think it started. Um, I've been trying to do some reading, and uh, I'm kind of struggling to to start reading uh, or do anything. Um, so I thought I would do some the reading out loud, and that would make me get through it. And um, this is a bit of a book that I've read a bit of before. I uh, wrote a bit about it in my thesis, but um, I didn't really read it properly, I don't think. I think I kind of just like, skimmed through and pulled some bits out that I liked. So I'm going to read um, a bit from the beginning of uh, Three Steps on the Ladder of Writing by Elena Sisu. I'm going to turn this screen off so I can't see myself. Okay. Let us go to the School of Writing we will spend three school days initiating ourselves in the strange science of writing, which is a science of farewells, of reunitings. I will begin with H. That is what writing is. I speak to you today, today, April 24th, 1990, today, June 24th, 1990, through two languages. From one day to another, from one page to the other, writing changes languages. I have thought certain mysteries in the French language that I cannot think in English. This loss and this gain are in writing too. I've drawn the H, you'll recognize it, depending on which language you are immersed in. This is what writing is, I. One language, I, another language, and between the two, the line that makes them vibrate. Writing forms of passageways between two shores. H. You see the stylized outline of a ladder. This is the ladder right and climbs, the one that is important to me. Perhaps you're going to tell me this H is an H. I mean the letter H. After all, in French, H is a letter rich with significance. Indeed, I write H and I hear H, which is the French for axe. H is pronounced ash in French. This is already transported from whosoever desires to write. In addition to the H, a cutting instrument, an axe to clear new paths. The letter is granted uncommon favours in the French alphabet. If A is masculine, as is B, C, D, E, etc., only H is masculine, neuter, or feminine at will. How could I not be attached to H? In addition, in French, H is a letter out of breath. Before it was reduced to silence during the French Empire, it was breathed out and aspirated, and it remembers this, even if we forget. It protects the heros, la hardies, la harp, <laughs> la harp, uh, la harmony, la hassad, la hata, la her. I'm really sorry, I, really, I gave up French for GCC, uh, from any excessive hurt. I can only tell, tell you these mysteries silently in French, but in English, his breath, let's keep it. I was saying this H, this ladder is writing. This is how I figure it. The ladder is neither immobile nor empty. It is animated. It incorporates the movement. It arouses and, and inscribes. My ladder is frequented. I say my because my love for it is climbed by those authors I feel a mysterious affinity for. Affinities, choices are always secret. When choosing a text, I am called. I obey the call of certain texts, or I am rejected by others. The texts that call me have different voices, but they all have one voice in common. They all have, with their differences, a certain music I am attuned to, and that's the secret. You may already know the ones whose music I hear. I have brought them with me. I will make them resound. There is Clarice Lispector, whose music is dry, hard, and severe, like Bernhard's. There is more tender, melodious music of Sveteva, or the more heartening music of uh, Ingeborg Bachmann. All of these people frequented the same ladder. To us, the ladder has a descending movement because the ascent which evokes effort and difficulty is towards the bottom. I say ascent downwards because we ordin ordinarily believe the descent is easy. The writers I love are descenders, explorers of the lowest and the deepest. 
Descending is deceptive, carried out by those I love. The descent is sometimes intolerable. The descenders descend with difficulty. Sometimes they stop descending, like Kafka. Quote, you say I should go down further still, but I am already very deep down. And yet, if I must be so, I will stay here. What a place. It is probably the deepest place there is, and I will stay here. Only do not force me to climb down any deeper. You may know that Kafka, so end quote, you may know that Kafka has two people and sometimes addresses himself as thou, as did Leonardo da Vinci. There are two ways of clambering downward, by plunging into the earth and going deep into the sea, and neither is easy. The element, and I would like to have you hear this word said by Setava in Russian, stikia. Um, she means both the element, both the element matter and the element poetic verse. The word element signifies both things in Russian. The element resists the earth and the sea offer resistance as does language or thought. But when you descend into the earth, I imagine you mine the earth like a miner and go down feet first. Perhaps this is wrong. Perhaps we should imagine a descent into the earth that is not feet first. And when you descend into the sea, then you can imagine whatever you wish, head first, and you are in a fetal position, or perhaps birth is towards the bottom, or the other way up, or straight ahead, standing upright. The body inscribes part of its effort, depending on its position and need, in order to descend and work against the current, against the earth. It inscribes the orientation of its drives, which is difficult. When we climb up towards the bottom, we proceed carried in the direction of we're searching for something, the unknown. We will use this ladder, traveling along the steps, the movements, like periods, eras, airs, airs in French, airs, airs, look out for this phonetic play on words. Epochs, leading towards the deepest, Towards what I call the truth, towards what calls me, attracts me magnetically, irresistibly. Of course, I circle the truth with all kinds of signs, quotation marks and brackets, to protect it from any form of fixation or conceptualization, since it is one of these words that constantly crosses our universe in a dazzling wake. That is also pursued by suspicion. I will talk about truth again, without which, without the word truth, without the mystery truth, there would be no writing. It is what writing wants. It is the truth. But, sorry. It is what writing wants. But it, the truth, is totally down below and a long way off. And all the people I love and whom I have mentioned are beings who are bent on directing they're writing towards this element over here with unbelievable labor. They are fighting against the elements and principally against the innumerable immediate exterior and interior enemies. The exterior is very powerful at the present time. We are living particles, fireflies in the world and around us resounds an enormous concert of noise and rumor producing machines creating a din and rumors destined to ensure we don't hear the voice of truth. But the interior enemies are just as numerous. It, con it concerns our fear. This is what we are made of, our weakness. Kafka told us paradise is not lost. We are the ones who haven't yet re re regained it. And if we haven't regained it, it's because we are suffering from two vices, laziness and impatience. As a result, we do nothing and don't advance. We stop out of laziness, hurry from impatience. Between the two, the work of descending isn't accomplished. Paradise is down below. According to my people, writing isn't given. Giving oneself to writing means being in a position to do the work of digging and unburying. And this entails a long period of apprenticeship, since it obviously means going to school. Writing is the right school. What I have learned cannot be generalized, but it can be shared. There are important moments of apprenticeship. The first moment of writing is the school of the dead. And the second moment of writing is the school of dreams. The third moment, the most advanced, the highest, the deepest is the school of roots. 
Today is the first day, the first hour of this journey. We will go to the school of the dead. I've announced that, that we would go to the school of the worst. This is inaccurate. I dared not say in my letter that on, on the first day we would go to the dead. One, we need a dead woman to begin. To begin writing, living, we must have death. I like the dead. They're the doorkeepers who, while closing one side, give way to the other. We must have death, but young, present, ferocious, fresh death, the death of the day, today's death, the one that comes right up to us so suddenly that we don't have time to avoid it. I mean to avoid feeling its breathing, its breath touching us. Ha! After, but because afterwards, most of our most of us spend our lives not seeing the picture of Alexander's death hanging in the classroom. Quote: Death is in front of us. Rather, as on the class, classroom wall, there is a reproduction of Alexander's battle. The thing is to is to darken, or even indeed to blot out the picture in this one life of ours through our actions. End quote. It's true that neither death nor the doorkeepers are enough to open the door. We must also have the courage, the desire to approach, to go to the door. Writing in the, uh, is this effort not to obliterate the picture, not to forget. This, uh, this is how it is to Lespector, to Svetava, to Ingeborg Bachmann. All of those I have loved each one of his or her different language, each one according to his or her voice, smile, tears, each one different from the others. Until I discovered later that in the beginning, each one of them had an inaugural scene from which writing spouted. Because it is always a question of a scene with a picture, the picture is the open door we must go through. Here is the birth scene of writing from Thomas Bernhard. Quote, this path took me past the butcher's shop. Open doors, axes, knives, cleavers, tidily arranged, slaughtering instruments, some bloody, others shining and clean, slaughtering pistols, then the noise of the horses collapsing, those huge open bellies, vomiting bones, pus and blood, then past the butchers, a few steps leading to the cemetery, to the morgue, to the tomb. During the first day, I still remember, in addition, a pale youth exhibited at the morgue, the son of a cheesemaker, and from there, my heart still beating on my schoolroom seat, a young woman schoolteacher. My grandmother always took me with her. Moreover, in the morning, I walked alone in front of the cemetery. In the afternoon, she took me to visit the morgue. She picked me up saying, look, a woman lying here, nothing but a corpse, end quote. I immediately recognized the way to school as future skinned animals to go to school. We must pass before a butcher's shop through the slaughter to the cemetery door through the cemetery, our hearts beating from so much death until we reach young life. This is our primary school, the school before school, the school to go to school where I went throughout my childhood out of luck and necessity. I lived in Klos Salembia and the upper outskirts of Algiers. And to get to school every day, I passed, I went by bus, the K-line, in front of the Catholic cemetery. The Catholic cemetery was my death as a Jewish girl. The cemetery spoke Latin. It said to me, O mors spes et victoria. I heard, la mors, the horse's bit, la aspect, the species. A horse resisted. Whose was the victory? Everything happened to me in the cemetery in a hostile manner. It isn't by accident that we find in our memories the cemetery in front of the school once again. The first apprenticeship is the school with the cemetery. Kafka didn't go by a foreign, they are always foreign, cemetery. Had the battle in front of his eyes in the classroom. We then spend our lives not seeing what we saw. The picture is there, what we know when we are small. When we are small, we know everything in a childlike way.
I said that the first dead are our first masters, those who unlock the door for us that opens onto the other side, if only we are willing to bear it. Writing is the noblest function, is the attempt to unerase, to unearth, to find the primitive picture again, ours, the one that frightens us. Strangely, it concerns a scene. The picture is not here, it's not, it's not there without a reason. Those who have been in contact with this opening door perceived it in the theatrical form of a scene. Why a scene? Why is it a scene? Why will it become the scene of a crime? Because we are the audience of the scene. We are not in the scene. When we go to the theatre, we are not on stage. We are witnesses to an extraordinary scene whose secret is on the other side. We are not the ones who have the secret. It's a pictorial scene. The opening scene of My Pushkin by Sutfada, I should have, I should have um, learned these words before. I've obviously only read it in my head before. Begins with a picture. It begins like a chapter in the, in the novel. Sorry, quote. It begins like a chapter in that novel, the indispensable bedside book of our mothers and grandmothers, Jane Eyre, the mystery of the Red Room, in the Red Room, a mysterious cabinet. But before the mysterious cabinet, there was something else, a picture in my mother's room, the duel. The duel represents the death of Pushkin, so end quote. The duel represents the death of Pushkin. First, there's the picture, which we either enter or don't enter, the duel, death. And the, picture, and the picture form a door, a window, an opening. Montaigne said philo, 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 philosophy, philosophizing is learning to die. Writing is learning to die. It's learning not to be afraid. In other words, to live on the extremity of life, which is what the dead, the dead death give us. I'll say this in parenthesis. Perhaps the dead man is the one who gives, while the dead woman gives less. I don't know. I'm showing my ignorance. While the dead woman, I'm showing my ignorance. Perhaps the dead man and not the dead woman enable us to receive. I'm talking about the father or mother or whoever, or whoever is in the place of the father or mother. Perhaps we can't receive from the dead mother what the dead father gives us. The dead, the dead man's get death gives us the essential primitive experience access to the other world which is not without warning or noise but which is without the loss of our birthplace so it gives us everything it gives us the end of the world to be human to need to experience the end of the world to need to lose the world to lose a world and to discover that there is more than one world and that the world isn't what we think it is without that we know nothing about mortality and immortality we carry. We don't know we're alive as long as we haven't encountered death. These are banalities that have long been erased, but it is an act of grace. Dostoevsky received the world without having lost it. We always come back to the experience of Abraham and Isaac to receive it because he was condemned to death because he was in front of a firing squad and then was pardoned. In extremis, this is grace, death given, then taken back. Of course, I'm only talking about the death of the loved one. It's only a question of love there. And everything, everything loss brings as it takes away. We lose and in losing we win. This doesn't happen together. This doesn't happen together. It can happen in a deferred, sustained or continuous manner. As far as Bernhard is concerned, we might say that losing becomes winning in an effulgurating con continuity. He tells the story of how he began writing. He was hospitalized at the age of 18 and declared beyond all hope. His grandfather whom he adored, was in the same hospital and doing well, he tells us, then suddenly passed away. Bernhard, quote, I begin to write hundreds and thousands of poems, end quote. This is admirable because it inscribes an overabundance in apparent realism. 
an extraordinary vital stream. I exist, quote, I existed only when I was writing, end quote. We comprehend that it is necessary to write, to no longer stop, since not dying and writing have been exchanged, quote. And since my father, the poet, was dead, now I had the right, had the right to write, and I used the entire world, transforming it into poems, end quote. Here the cause of this spring of writing, which occurs as an answer or an erection, as resistance to castration, is said brutally. But I prefer to talk about it in terms of feminine sexuality, as a vital spring brought about and ordered by the disappearance of the one who was the source. The grandfather wasn't just anyone, he was the poet, the one who had always loved him, who had everything to who was everything to him. In Potenza, Clarice the Spectre has similarly told us how she had been convinced in the hope that her sick mother would survive in the superstitious fantasy that if the mother produced life, she would be cured, which didn't happen. The mother died. Clarice reveals in a dry voice how after her mother's death, she always considered herself to be the soldier who deserted. And yet this happened without her being able to do anything about it. This is what we sometimes have difficulty hearing or accepting. We can do nothing about it. And yet desertion, flight, impotency are printed on the classroom wall. They are linked, associated. There is death. The, mis the misfortune or fortune which will make our lives an unending struggle to be fair, is that in losing, we have something to gain. Mixing loss and gain, that's our crime. This is what we are always guilty of. Guilt we can't do anything about with these unexpected and terrible gains. The first book I wrote rose from my father's tomb. I don't know why, perhaps it was the only thing I had to write then. In my poverty, my inexperience, my only asset, the only thing that made me live and I had lived, that put me to the test and that I felt because it completely defeated me. It was my strange and monstrous treason. I didn't think about all of this, otherwise I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have written. For a long time, I lived through my father's death with the feeling of immense loss and childlike regret. As it was an inverted, uh, as in an inverted fairy tale. Ah, if my father had lived. I naively fabricated other magnificent stories until the day things changed colour and I began to see other scenes, including everything I could imagine that was less consoling without over investing. I've moved on to less idealised reflection, to reconstruction. I could imagine various scenes without my father. The perfect scene, but which one? The imperfect scene, the scene of interdiction, the commonplace one, the classic one I didn't write. But I said to myself I wouldn't, that I wouldn't have written. I wouldn't have had death if my father had lived. I had written this several times. He gave me death to start with. Recently, my mother, who, in a simple, who, who is a simple and straightforward soul, read one of my books and said to me, so your father's death was that serious for you? Yes, I said, and I've told you this a hundred times, but doubtlessly the message didn't get through, and I calmly explained what I am telling you, to which my mother replied. To which my mother replied, for me too. I know that my mother lost, lost my father all her life. She has been with that husband, <clears throat> her young husband, and that, that, and that this was a real loss. She lost the man she loved. She said, by chance he is dead. If not, he would, he would never have become who she is. If not, she would never have come who she is. When my father was alive, my mother, my mother didn't work because my father was a young primitive Jew because my father had a young primitive Jew's dignity. He was the one who should provide for the family. My mother became a midwife after my father's death. She conducted hundreds and hundreds of deliveries, having, having vaguely elaborated 
what cannot be said in words. What is liberated by a straightforward and simple soul's mourning can also be life. We don't know, either universally or individually, exactly what our relationship to the dead is. Individually, it constitutes part of our work, a work of love, not of hate or destruction. We must think through each relationship. We can think this with the help of writing. If we know how to write, if we dare write, also with the help of dreams, they give us the marvelous gift of constantly bringing back, bringing back our dead alive, with the result that at night we can talk to our dead. Each of us, individually and freely, must do the work that, cons that consists of rethinking what is, what is your death and my death, which are inseparable. Writing originates in this relationship in what is often inadmissible, contrary, terribly dangerous and risk turning into complacency, which is the worst of all crimes. It originates here. We're the ones who make the death something mortal and negative. Yes, it is mortal. It is bad, but it is also good. This depends on us. We can be the killers of the dead. That's the worst of all, because when we kill a dead person, we kill ourselves. But we can also, on the contrary, be the guardian, the friend, the regenerator of the dead. Writing is the complex is this complex activity, this learning to die. What is what is not to kill, knowing there is death, not denying it and not proclaiming it. Our crime isn't what we think. It isn't the crime in the newspapers. It's always a bit less, a bit more. In life, as soon as I say my. As soon as I say my daughter, my brother, I'm verging on a form of murder. As soon as I forget to unceasingly recognize the other's difference. You may come to know your son, your sister, your daughter, well after 30, 40 or 50 years of life. And yet during those, uh, those 30 or 40 years, you haven't known this person who was so close. You kept him or her in this realm of the dead and the other way around. When the one who dies kills and the one who doesn't die, so when, sorry, and the other way around, then the one who dies kills and the one who doesn't die when the other dies as well. Surviving is not what we think. This is what Lydia to shoot, <laughs> to Shukov, to, Lydia to Shukov is here. Confi confides us in the La Plonge. This woman, who was Anna Arkmatova Ar Ar and <laughs> Nadia Malmstrom's friend, um, belonged to the small universe of women stuck by the same misfortune. Women from whom half the body, half the soul, the child, the lover, the spouse had been torn. For the Soviets, in their bizarre madness during the years of darkness, sent, sent millions of Russians to concentration camps, but inexplicably often let their wives survive. Anna Akhmatova, who lost, uh, who lost the first husband, executed by firing squad, a second husband, deported, then executed, and whose son was deported, had Nadia Malmström for a friend, whose husband, the great poet, was, de was deported for poetry, and then... Lydia Tchakova's husband was deported because he was a Jewish scholar. When he was arrested, Lydia was notified of the verdict. Quote, 10 years without the right to correspond, end quote. So like hundreds of women, she lined up with parcels in front of the prison wall until the day she learned that 10 years without the right to correspond was a, me was a metaphor for immediate execution. For several years, She'd been carrying inside herself a living dead man, alive within her, decomposing outside of her. This is the story of Edgar Allan Poe's Mr. Valdemar. Mr. Valdemar call, calls the narrator, who is a hypnotist, telling him to come quickly since he is about to die. It is time, according to their pact, for him to hypnotize the dying man. The narrator arrives. Mr. Valdemar doesn't hear the narrator, who is who has who has just enough time to catch his breath and put him to sleep. After rather a long time, we hear that Mr. Valdemar, who is now in a hypnotic state, is suffering ter terribly. When the narrator wakes up Mr. Valdemar, 
the sleeper's life breaks out in a flow, flow of pus because he was dead. This is Tchotchkova's story. The loved one remained inside her, a dead man, inexplicably without his death. Tchotchkova obviously tells us about plunging, as if, as if it's drink, drinking or eating. She says, I'm going to plunge. This plunge is a way of going to write. The book begins with something dreadful. She screams at night, and it's always the same dream. She dreams that her dead husband has come back. He walked past her. He looked at her with hatred, acts as if he doesn't know her, and goes to speak to other people. Each time, it's the same cruel dream, which she doesn't understand. Hatred burns between them, until suddenly one day she understands the hatred this man she loves so much has shown her. She understands her hatred, her own hatred, their hatred, which satisfies itself in her dreams. She is staging all her strength in the fact that the dead man reproaches her for being alive. This is something we cannot come to terms with since she is both character at once herself and her him. She is guilty of being a survivor. She didn't follow him. She isn't him. We know these returns. I've lived so many of them. In If This Is A Man, Primo Levi spoke, sp speaks of the dream he had which is, um, he says, a dream all the deportees had, the absolute nightmare, the dream of the impossible return. The deportee returns to his family, everyone is at the table, and he is not received. They don't listen to him, they don't believe him, they don't understand him. They deprive him of his suffering, they take away his dreadful possession, his, his truth as a tortured prisoner, he is guilty of being a victim. It is experience turned inside out. Not dying, living after the other, remaining, is also an intolerable experience. It's this point that we feel, though we can do nothing about it, that there may be the unpardonable in ourselves. There is a murder that assassinates us. It's not you, it's not me. It's between me and you, between you and me, between my love and your love, there is murder. All great texts are prey to the question, who is killing me? Whom am I giving myself to kill? We passionately love murder stories, we believe. We are reading one of Dostoevsky's books, but what we are tasting is the account of our own murder. The notebooks for the idiot are haunted by the initial nucleus from which the idiot was born. The idiot is the book that survived many other books. The book that will be published in, uh, is the strongest, the one that mysteriously f survived all of the others. Beneath this book are hundreds of books that were never written, that were gradually pushed aside. In the notebooks for the idiot, hundreds of books that were proposed, erased, and at the same time reproduced so that the idiot could exist, lie helplessly in ruins. The initial story, the starting shot from which the idiot arose, was, anecdotally or unanecdotally, a news item. A young 16-year-old girl, Umexkia, had killed her entire family after having been victimized. She is there throughout the notebooks. She is constantly transformed. Sometimes she's a man, sometimes a woman, sometimes young, sometimes old. She will end up dividing herself between Natasha Filipovna um, and uh, Ragunji. Dostoevsky was prey to the was prey to the character's mystery. What causes a young woman to bloody the entire house? She is a monster who isn't a monster. I could be her. I who am also you. Quote from his upbringing and surrounding. He early imbibed his his poison, which had penetrated his, penetrated his very bloodstream. The idiot himself is the criminal at that moment. His magnanimity and his yearning for love derives in general from an infinite from an infinitely outraged heart. He has never been able to heal these wounds, and therefore he has retaliated and revenged himself on all those who have liked to love without limit and to shed his very very blood for all those dearest dear to him. Instead of useful activity, evil. Or else he sat down one day and wrote out his will. 
he wanted to kill himself, but he didn't. Instead, he began an intrigue. They set fire to the house. A precious question and answer. You will end, quote, you will end up either by committing a great crime or by performing a great deed, end quote, says the son to him. Quote, God willing, he replied quite seriously and faintly, but more likely by nothing of the sort. His yearning to do some noble deed so as to distinguish himself and surpass everyone else. They set, they set the house on fire and the burn at and the burn finger. Note. He loves Amitaskia, a strange and utterly childlike friendship with the Eurodivania. She never in instructs him as to his duties towards his wife. She merely acts. In, in, the country, in the country, she had twice set fire to a barn so as to be like Olga and Metzger. She set fire in, Pe in Petersburg too. Perhaps it would be better to make him a legitimate son, set up a detailed plan and tonight begin. Then die well. One can die well, even when spitting one's last vanity, the baby, your suffering mountains. When it becomes necessary, why not speak out? Since you wanted to shoot yourself, why shoot yourself? To the hospital, spittle, how stupid I am. You make too much of a furrow about your dying. One can die more nobly. Well, shoot yourself as if you frighten us. But I don't allow you to. No, I don't allow it. Talk to me a little about Christ, Prince. Since I have two weeks more, telling the truth or lying is absolutely the same to me. Why is it necessary in the construction of the world that there should be people condemned to die? Would you like to know why? Read the notebooks of the idiot and you'll know everything. We need those who are condemned to death and we, and we need books that condemn us. Here's what Kafka wrote in 1902 to his friend Pollock. Quote, I think we ought to only read the kind of books that wound and stab us. If the book we are reading doesn't wake us up with a blow on the head, what are we reading it for? So that it will make us happy as you write Good Lord, we would be happy precisely if we had no books, and the kind of books that make us happy are the kind we could write ourselves if we had to. But we need the books that affect us like a disaster, that grieve us deeply, like the death of someone we love more than ourselves, like being banished into forests far from everyone, like a suicide. A book must be the axe for the frozen sea inside us, that is my belief." End quote. He wrote this letter because his friend had reproached him for not having answered his letters. Kafka answered him by saying, excuse me, but I was reading. The book was so important I couldn't stop. Always the same virulent relationships, the book first, then you. I too believe we should only read those books that wound us and stab us and wake us up with a blow on the head or strike us like terrible events that do or don't do us good that don't do us good in doing us good a book like the death of someone we love more than ourselves or that is like being banished into forests far from everyone or books that are like a suicide or as he says at the end a book must be the axe for the frozen sea inside us that is what i believe but it but it also saddens me because very few books are axes very few books hurt us very few books break the frozen sea. Those books that do break the frozen sea and kill us are the books that give us joy. Why are su such books so rare? Because those who write the books that hurt us also suffer, also undergo a kind of suicide, also get lost in forests, and this is frightening. You do not want to lose yourself so easily in writing. Yes, this is what Cl Clarice Lispector did. Not only did she do this metaphorically, she also did it in reality. Not only do her books try to be the axe, but at the end of her rather short life, she wrote The Hour of the Star, which actually deals with the life and death of a character named Na Maccabee, a kind of woman, a person who is so slight she almost does not exist. 
throughout the writing of the book, everyone is terrified. The writer is terrified. The book is terrified. The text starts telling us something, then it gives up. We feel as if something terrible is going to happen, and we readers are also frightened. We keep thinking that something we don't want to happen will happen, only it doesn't happen. We go with misgivings from page to page, and suddenly it begins. The text strikes. The book is finished. Maccabee is dead. But but not only is Maccabee dead, Clarissa the Spectre is also dead. She died immediately afterwards. The book w has achieved, in a most truthful way possible, the reality, the secret of writing. Clarice the Spectre was ill. She did not know she was going to die, but she knew it the moment she finished the book. One does not really know who wrote the book or who killed who. One does not know whether Clarice the Spectre wrote the book in haste because she thought she was going to die or, or whether the book put an end to her life. Because of this strange connection between writing and dying, writers feel a strange desire for death. They feel like dying, but it is something they cannot say. I cannot say I feel like dying because it, because it is forbidden, and yet it is really the only thing one should say. The writers I feel close to are those who play with fire, those who play seriously with their own mortality, go further, go too far, sometimes go as far as catching fire, as far as being seized by fire, how terrible to learn how uh, Ingeborg Bachmann perished, burned by fire. That is, by truth, in 1971 in Rome, while in the same period Clarice the Spectre was pulled from the flames by her son. How terrible and how amazing. I find the same desires, the same cries in the in introduction to Ingeborg Bachmann's Franza. Quote, I have often wondered, and you too, I suppose, what has become of the virus of crime? It cannot suddenly have disappeared from the universe, end quote. She wrote this introduction at the time, uh, at the time in Austria when anti-Semitism, Holocaust and desecration were underground. Quote, of course, massacres belong to the past, end quote, she writes, adding, quote, the assassins are still among us, end quote. She wrote that at a time when we might have thought we had buried Auschwitz, what she writes is dangerous because Auschwitz is already there in every human being. In an interview in which she talked about her books, she says everything is war. War doesn't begin with the first bombs that were dropped. It doesn't begin with the terror recounted in the newspapers. It begins in the relationship between people. She also insists, quote, fascism is the first thing in the relationship between man and woman. I have tried to say that here, that in this society, it's always war. Not that there is war and peace, there is only war, end quote. It's harsh, but that's her, in truth, in the Austrian predicament. In France, we also say there is war, but we also say we are subjects of peace. But in Austria, there is only war. I'm going to stop. This is part one.